Fear of the Dark Chapter 1 Personal Recollection of Tizikiku Nazikiaka Kiatkata, also known as Tika, Senior Ambassador to the Galactic Senate Head of Diplomatic Relations Council, Turinica Conclave. Log has been partitioned for study by Diplomatic Relations Council. First partition. Begin log. We knew the Terrans had been building, but when I saw the returns on the display, the sight took my breath away. We had just shed the vapor-like trails of exiting from the hyperspace channel when everyone seemed to collectively turn their heads to the display overlaid on the broad viewport overlooking the darkness of the Kelvin system. That's when the returns came in. The entire bridge of my small diplomatic skimmer was silent. Even my adjutant Xia had stopped her incessant squawking. Terrans, or humans as we had initially called them, had a fleet on hand that was, to be blunt, absolutely terrifying. Before we had even realized we were all holding our collective breaths, the entire display suddenly chimed what sounded like a thousand times over from registered queries from the fleet, all of them outlined first in a soft white, then a glaring hot orange. Weapons were being locked. For a moment, a dread-filled moment, I wondered if this was how a diplomatic career of over 230 rotations was going to end, evaporated under a hail of fire from a fleet that shouldn't exist from a people that every estimate said should have been subjugated or enslaved twelve times over. The orange hues faded as quickly as they began, however. That's when I breathed out. I ruffled my feathers to cool myself. The instinct to take flight when danger presents itself still has its side effects, you know. The rush of blood to heat the body to withstand the wind and cold. The sudden rigid arch of my wings that needed to be compelled to relax. The sublight engines had already kicked on, but we were in idle station holding. I don't think my navigator wanted to approach what was waiting in the dark. My species has never liked the dark. The endless night outside the viewport looked like a house's doorway unguarded with its door open. In the dark, like I was seeing out of the viewport, we would sit in our homes and close all of our windows, hiding from the night like it was a predator. In times of fear, when faced with the night, some of our more shameful kind would squall and push themselves against the furthest wall from the dark, praying to the Great Mother staring in wide-eyed terror at the darkness, just hoping we didn't see the darkness staring back. Looking out of the viewport, we all felt something in the dark looking back. Only pinpricks of light were visible, and the distant dwarf star that anchored the system. The chime of a read-only message sounded, and I, to my credit, did not flinch. Cleared to approach, dock with Thermopylae Station. Much had changed with the Terrans, and not all of it good from my government's view. I still remember a quip from a diplomat that had come from United Earth's government. It went something like, What a change a year makes. Well, if my conversion from my planet's cycles to the Soul System's year was right, that conversation had happened nearly ninety years ago. Thermopylae Station didn't exist back then. The government of United Earth didn't exist anymore. Nothing about the species we had once called humans remained the same except their general appearance. What a change ninety years makes. Ninety years ago I was happy to meet the United Earth Delegate, a pleasant man with dark skin with a name that our translators struggled with. He eventually just consigned to allow us to call him Tombs, which wasn't his real name. But then again my own name he couldn't pronounce. He had called me Tika. It was a pleasant sound when he said it. They were so optimistic, the humans ready to work with us, ready to sign combined research treaties and trade agreements. They preferred diplomacy, trade, and exchange between themselves and others. They were excited at every chance to learn about the cultures of the universe. I knew that that wasn't the case today. My eyes darted to the shapes that were becoming visible, the ships and the distant but ever-expanding Thermopylae station. Interesting fact about the Terrans, Xia chirped. The station is named after a battle where a small group of warriors held off a massively superior enemy in their home world's history. I said nothing but the name was appropriate. My own people, the Turinica, border the Vral, and long ago we consigned ourselves to the knowledge that our galactic neighbors would come at us at the first sign of weakness. They view our pacifism as beneath contempt, our worship of our god laughable. In fact, the Vral view very little as sacred besides strength, which luckily, even though we view its use as distasteful in the extreme, my people have in abundance with our fleets. 
I can admit to a certain level of exhaustion in dealing with the Vral at my government's request. No message I had sent in my long time as a diplomat was ever replied to or even acknowledged. In the time I've been a diplomat, even before I met Tombs, we had watched the Vral swallow two species back to back, until only the small nation of Chua stood between themselves and United Earth's territory. The Chua were a proud people, stubborn, but very proud. They simply wanted to be left alone in their small corner of space, and the humans, while disappointed by their lack of desire to engage, respected that as did the humans' galactic neighbors, one of which being my own people. The fall of Chua's northern galactic neighbor, the Shesvia, stunned the entire galactic community. While everyone expected the Vral to test the Shesvi, no one expected them to fail that test so spectacularly. It took the Vral only a cycle to take all of Shesvi space, and when the Vral took space they made sure everyone knew about it. Needless to say, for weeks after the Vral took a planet, you didn't want to turn on the hollow if you were close enough to their space for their broadcasts or didn't have an encrypted receiver. Any complaints made in the Galactic Senate chambers would be drowned out by the sick, wet sound of raw laughter. It was during one of those sessions, fresh off of a broadcast of the Shesvia being hunted for sport, of Shesvia youths being shackled and branded in front of their birth givers that were then executed, that the Vral ambassador came into the Galactic Senate, turned to the Hua's seat, and in front of all the senators present declared war on the Chua. The Chua ambassador just sat there quietly. My emotions flew to him. The Chua only possessed four worlds, but those worlds were connected to the wider galaxy by eight primary hyperspace lanes. A war against the Vral wasn't a war at all, it was an execution. We of the Teratanti live very long lives, and memory is a fickle thing. Still, I remember how Toombs looked as he stood up from the United Earth seat directly behind the Chua ambassador and immediately walked out of the Senate hearing. The Rawl ambassador had not even reached his seat before Toombs returned and walked directly to the side of the Chua ambassador and whispered something in his ear. It was the first time the Chua ambassador had moved, turning to the human who towered over them, and bowed his head in what I know to be their people's expression of utmost gratitude and acceptance. Toombs then stood and loudly declared that United Earth would be honoring its defensive military pact with the Chua Republic, and formally declared war against the Vral. To this day I can't remember ever knowing about such a pact. The Vral turned back to the two, the Chua ambassador and Toombs, and laughed. At first I thought it was blind arrogance or maybe self-preservation that caused the humans to jump to the aid of the Chua. It wasn't. At the end of the day, United Earth had long seen what the Vral were doing as predatory and disgusting. Toombs declared on several occasions that the Vral were just bullies and that the only way to stop a bully was to stand up to them. My people had entertained notions of joining a loose coalition that would stand together against attack by the Vral, but that was all they remained, entertained notions. The humans of United Earth had for years been trying to form that coalition after bringing us the idea. They had been in talks with my people, the Shivas, the Balaxi, the Duma, and even the Kolra, who responded to most requests for contact with the vilest insults they could transmit. As far as I knew, no one wanted to join with them, believing it would provoke the Vral. As my shuttle passed underneath the shadow of one of the massive human battleships emblazoned with the mark of the Terran front, I wondered if the Bilexi, Duma, Kolra, and a few others had regretted not taking the hands of the humans when it was offered. Once again the shuttle had fallen silent. I had been in a system very similar to this one, looking at a fleet of smooth lines, lit up like a proud standard. United Earth's symbol had been emblazoned on every silvery hull, and while the humans were nervous about the war to come, they were proud to stand in defense of another, something I found quite noble in them. Forgive my ramblings. They say when a Teratanti reaches elderhood they spend most of their time remembering fondly days past, but I can't help but remember it now. I again am wondering what I'm preparing to walk into. The United Earth Fleet was built to shine as a beacon of hope and a promise of a better tomorrow, as Tombs had told me, a notion I of course found preposterous. Weapons, to my people, are shameful things that are an unfortunate necessity, only to be shown when there is no other way and hidden away the moment they are no longer needed. 
I had to admit back then, however, that the Terran ships, if anything, were very elegantly designed. The shadow of the battleship overhead, though, it fills me with a certain prickling sensation. All that fills my mind now as I look up at the harsh edges of gun ports, the sleet knife-like energy weapons barrels, and the simply monstrous spinal-mounted cannon, is that something has happened to this pure and noble people. Something dark, something wrong. This wasn't a beacon of hope. It was a symbol of dread, a promise of annihilation. And once again I find myself wondering why in the name of the Great Mother I came here. End of Log Chapter 2 Addendum to File Address by President Hikora Sati of United Earth Shortly after the declaration of the First Veral War Citizens of United Earth, today we embark on the great mission in support of our neighbors. The Chiwa, since we have met them, have only asked one thing, to be left to their own devices, to be left to themselves, and to be able to live their lives undisturbed. They have been silent neighbors, but they have left us in peace with no reservations, only that we respect their borders and boundaries. We have had our minor disputes, but they have always been there to discuss them, always willing to find a compromise. They do not dream of a star-spanning empire, nor do they wish to force their will on others. In the past hours we have learned much of the Shua, how each citizen of their republic is expected to grow and tend a garden once they reach adulthood. The Chua believe that self-sufficiency and personal responsibility to not only the individual but their environment is a virtue of the highest standing, and the worlds of the Chua Republic are lined with such gardens. The Chua grow their gardens as a reflection of their life, some ordered and road, some chaotic and natural, but all are expressions. The Chua say you can tell a lot about someone by looking at their garden. The Vral, on the other hand, only hold power as a virtue, and we have seen what they do with that power. You have made your opinions known, on social media, to your representatives, and now we have made our opinion known to the galaxy. Those of you unfortunate enough to have seen the depravity of the broadcasts from the Vral Empire understand this even better than most. You have demanded action, and your representatives have answered the call. In the most recent Galactic Senate Assembly, the Vral have declared war against the Chua Republic. The Chua gave them no cause. They made no offense that would give the Vral any reason to attack. The Chua are no threat to the Vral and have made no mentions of interfering, not because they did not view what the Vral were doing as wrong, but because they did not have the strength to do so. End of addendum. Personal recollection of Tiziki Kun Azikia Kakiat Kata, also known as Tika, Senior Ambassador to the Galactic Senate, Head of Diplomatic Relations Council, Turinica Conclave. Log has been partitioned for study by Diplomatic Relations Council. Second partition. Begin log. What eventually became known to the wider galaxy as the First Orion War, and what the humans called the First Vral War, was barely twelve days old. The humans had met the Vral at the edge of the Shoth system. I had watched Tombs and his aides with compassion as the stories from the front began to come in. My own people still sing a song of the bravery of the United Earth First Fleet, the first to arrive, diving into the fight between the Chua and Vral saving the Chua fleet from annihilation and holding the line even as the odds began to stack against them. As the United Earth 2nd, 4th, and 5th fleet arrived to relieve them, Toombs was already speaking about the station. As we passed under the shadow of the battleship completely, I finally turned my eyes to the station. I still remember Toombs when he spoke of the pace of its construction. I never saw it in person. None of my people have. Now, almost ninety years later, I'm seeing it for the first time. Designed as a small refueling outpost, the entire station had been overhauled at an almost reckless speed. At the start of the First Vral War, it was barely two kilometers long. Now it was almost two hundred. Great Mother? I heard the trill from one of the younger aides, but I didn't look back to see who had broken the silence. No one was speaking. We all were looking at the station. If the ships of the Terran front filled me with a promise of dread, then Thermopylae Station filled me with awe and disquiet that shook me down to my chest. There was nothing beautiful or powerful looking about Thermopylae. Thermopylae Station was a wound in space that had never, and would never, heal. They say the station was built with the hulls of broken ships that limped or were towed back from the front. Kazia whispered to us all. 
The armor plate was welded into place to provide extra protection. The weapons, shields, everything. Thermopylae showed all the evidence of those words being true, and I knew it was true. Thermopylae was a floating hulk, with scars that had been repaired but never replaced. New plates had been welded next to what remained of corvettes and destroyers. Next to gashes through the armor of the station sat weapons pods, hard sealed into place. Missile silos larger than transports, rail guns, magnetic accelerators, beam weapons, and more than a fair amount of weapons of Chua design sat dotting the hull. Entire sections were visible that had been patched where the pockmarked and scarred hull of the station had been burned, scarred, or penetrated. As I let my eyes follow the abstract lines of the hull, I saw a ship designation symbol, UES-2265, and a name, UES Bonneville. I felt my mind drifting back to Tombs again, back to the Galactic Senate offices where I stood with Tombs those ninety years ago. Word has come in that the first is so badly mauled it's been cycled completely back to Shoth Prime to help the evacuation, he had said to me. I rustled my feathers in sympathy. Your other three fleets, they hold? I had asked, and Tombs had nodded. Barely. They might be able to hold the line for a month, maybe two. But every estimate we have heard of didn't even scratch the surface of how many ships they have. He had leaned back into his chair as I nestled myself on the perch he had supplied for me to rest comfortably in his office. Even our own, I had been concerned. Our intelligence was usually top of the line, beyond doubt. Even your own, Toombs had said to me. Human faces are so expressive. Sometimes I'm jealous of the way they can convey their exact emotions at just a glance. To show what he was feeling, I would have had to do a small dance, frill my crown, droop my wings. I wasn't jealous of his emotion then. What shall you do? I had asked, watching the human as he looked at me. Toombs leaned forward and placed his hands on the table. United Earth Command has picked up three other fleets converging from different points in Vral space towards the Shoth system. When they hit, if we're not in fighting retreat, we're going to be overwhelmed. Toombs's hazel eyes had locked onto mine. Ambassador, it's that time of day again. I had nodded graciously to him, knowing what was to come. Every day since the outbreak of the war, he had said the same thing. United Earth and its ally, the Chua Republic, Request your assistance in combating this shared threat to the peace and prosperity of our nations. Toombs said, opening his hands towards me. I had folded my wings and bowed my head as I had done every day prior. I will relay your request to my government and thank you for the regard you show us. The corner of his mouth had twitched and he had lowered his head then. Chua space is... Well, finished, he said, which had alarmed me. If we try to hold them, we'll lose Chua, Andreas, Antares, Alpha Centauri, Earth. Do the Chua agree with this assessment? I had asked, feeling my heart swell with sorrow, knowing that soon the Vrawl would be broadcasting yet again. Toombs gave a half-smile, something I knew from my time with the human that meant that he wasn't going to enjoy what he said next. It was the Chua that had to convince us. He had breathed in sharply when he reached the end of that statement and looked away. Emotion seemed to war across his face. Grief, sadness, resolve, a calabash of visible sorrow and fury. We were prepared to... His words fell away again and his eyes looked down to the table. He breathed in. Then he seemed to regain himself. They convinced us. Toombs had just stared at me then and I felt the gravity of his words. They have proposed a plan, and United Earth has signed off on it. Are you at liberty to tell me? I remembered asking. We are going to save as many Chua as we can, as much of their civilization as we can, as many of their people as we can. He then pointed at his desk where a map of the territory of the United Earth was embossed. I stood and looked down at the map as he motioned along a line of stars. We're going to engage in a fighting retreat along the Villimor Corridor here. Even now, we're evacuating as many people as we can out of Antares. And right here, his finger loudly poked down on the star system marked Kelvin. Here is where we will make our stand. I had slowly nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation. The Chua had declared their own home was lost, 
they had convinced the humans to acknowledge that. Their strategy is a sound one. That system is a natural choke point between the hyperlanes. Tombs had smiled at that. Very practical people, the Chua. They also have proposed something else. A station. I had canted my head to the side at that. A station? Tombs had nodded, then he laughed. Some Chua commander got the idea when he was on board the flagship of the first and saw a woman remounting a bulkhead using duct tape. Duct tape? I had asked. Tombs had laughed. Let me teach you an ancient wisdom of my people. Tombs had said to me, still grinning as he leaned back and pulled open one of the drawers on his desk. It is a lesson handed down by great sages, the legendary words that have been proven true and without fault a billion times in the past. He had taken out a very thick roll of adhesive banding wrapped in a roll. I leaned forward and inspected the wheel-shaped roll of silvery adhesive, then looked to Tombs. If you can't duck it, fuck it, he said. Then he laughed. I was truly confused. I believe the canting of my head made him laugh all the harder, which only confused me more. It took over three years for someone to explain to me what that actually meant, and since then I have kept the wheel of adhesive called duct tape with me. I am loath to use it as I have so little, but indeed it has proven useful too many times to count. As I look now, ninety years later, on the station tombs had spoken of, hull after hull had been stacked and sealed in place, armor had been sectioned and carved up, every harsh angle and scarred pit, an impact that had killed or maimed. The Chua and the humans had taken the refueling station and quite literally turned it into a bastion, using the broken hulls and bodies of their fleets to do it. The fleets of humanity had taken their wounded vessels and cannibalized them. I looked at the half-painted symbol of the UES Bonneville again, wondering how many had died on that ship before it had come here, during which war. In the end, the Rawls' fleets arrived in full force and United Earth had been pushed back. When a ship was too damaged to continue, it was brought here, to be welded into place, to have its weapons stripped and applied to the ever-expanding hull of the station. The Vral had broadcast with glee as they invaded the planets of the Chua, and United Earth nearly erupted into full revolt against the retreat as images of the Chua being murdered, enslaved, or worse, were sent out to any receiver within their signal range. The gardens burned. Every so often the Vral made sure to broadcast images of captured humans. Those in particular were disturbing. Several United Earth ships had to put down mutinies to stop the crew or the captains themselves from rebelling against the fighting retreat, and a few ships charged to their deaths against the Vral. They were doing anything they could to stop the carnage. The Vral moved into United Earth space next, not even bothering to chase down the ships full of refugees fleeing from Chiwa territory. They followed the United Earth fleets all the way back down what the humans called the Vilmo Corridor, only stopping at Antares. One and a half billion humans were on Antares when the Vral arrived in the system. Antares was a lifeless rock now. It had been these past nearly ninety years. The Vral had broadcast the suffering of the humans there for decades afterward, only ceasing the broadcast in the last two decades. I would like to say that the humans of Antares did not scream or cry or beg. I'd be lying if I said that. But I will say this. The Vral were not the only ones broadcasting, and the humans of Antares did not die in vain. The Vral had very little broadcasts of humans running for their lives. They had little to no broadcasts of human cubs being taken from their birth givers. Torture, murder, they had those in abundance. But they had to be selective. The entirety of the Shives commonality had fallen and been pacified by the Vral in under a full cycle, around nine United Earth months. And Terry's was never subdued, from what we learned from drone footage and first-hand accounts. It was never even close to pacified. The humans of Antares fought the Vral through everything they threw at them. The Vral's naval superiority could not be challenged, but on the ground war when it got close in, they were completely unprepared for the pure ferocity of the humans. Their campaign stalled entirely in the face of the Antares resistance, when the Vral, after nearly twenty cycles, almost a year and a half, quit the planet and bombarded it from orbit. By the time that happened, Tombs had already left the Galactic Senate to attempt to make it through the blockade of the hyperspace lanes. He did not make it through, being caught by a picket trying to run a smuggler's lane through hyperspace. 
Tombs did not allow them to capture him alive, his shuttle overloading its reactor as it was being boarded. After Antares was left a glowing ball hovering in the cosmos, the Vral made the jump into the Helna system. Two weeks later, the Vral jumped into the Kelvin system. Facing them was Thermopylae Station and all that remained of the United Earth and Chua fleets. I snapped back to the present again, my eyes popping wide as the feathers all along my spine felt electrified. We had just passed through the shield of the station. I hadn't been paying attention. The first Vral War had ended here, 88 years ago. The hulking, misshapen mass of Thermopylae anchored and protected the humans and the Chua, even as it exacted a horrific toll against the Vral. Positioned too close to the hyperlane to bypass, and with the reach of its weapon system so far, it was a plug to hold the bottleneck of the United Earth Core systems. The Vral battered themselves bloody as the humans and the Chua performed acts of absolutely suicidal bravery. I still remember sitting on my perch in my office as we watched the drone footage updates. The Vral's battle line trying to press. United Earth ships on the verge of coming apart at the seams fighting back. All the while, Thermopylae Station hammered endlessly against the invaders. The Chua protected transport after transport arriving at Thermopylae, sacrificing themselves so that ammunition, food, and supplies could get through. For two months, the Vral hurled themselves at the station and the fleet, trying to break them. Human and Chua ships would engage, fall back, repair, and in some cases be added to the mass of Thermopylae. The armored fist of the Vral military finally gave way, and the hulking masses of their battle fleet that were still capable fell back into Helena. The first war ended in much the same way it was declared, with the Vral ambassador coming before the Galactic Senate and announcing the war was over. The second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth Vral war had all ended much the same way. Right here with this floating mass of a station being the anchor that held the tide of the Vral back. As I felt the shuttle's pads touch down on the deck, I prepared myself to exit the shuttle. I stood slowly and made my way to the back towards the ramp that would flower open to allow me to step foot on Thermopylae Station. Just before one of my aides could reach out and tap the panel to allow that, I held up my hand and furled my wings. I took a deep breath in and craned my neck from side to side in a rare showing of discomfort. We are the first diplomatic mission that has been requested from the Galactic Senate in over 81 cycles by the humans. Most of them will not live longer than 120 cycles. A generation to them is 25 cycles, I said, turning my head to look at each of them in turn. That is over three generations of humans between the last time we contacted them and now. All of you know your assignments, I do not doubt that. I looked back to the panel for the door. I do not, however, know what the humans intend, or why they have specifically requested our species and myself to come. Three things I demand in our time here. One, stay to your assigned areas. Two, the last time I knew them, humans like to gamble. Do not gamble with the humans, for you will lose. A few small trill sounds of laughter sounded, and I reached for the panel, but then I stopped myself. And three, remember where you are. We will be assigned a liaison, and if you don't know if an action would be considered disrespectful, ask. Do not do the action first, then ask later. My mind went back to my first sight of Thermopylae Station floating amid the Terran Front Armada, a nightmarish collection of broken hulls and weapon systems forged from corpses of vessels that had held United Earth's defenders. For a moment I was silent, as suddenly a thought came to mind that I wish had not. But now that it had come, I couldn't shake it. I never read anywhere that when Thermopylae had been built, or in any brief, I had gotten afterward, that there had been any kind of attempt to retrieve the dead from inside broken segments of the hulls by which I was now surrounded. We are standing in a graveyard of their heroes. Do not forget that for one moment. I reached out and tapped the blue panel. It glowed white and the inner workings of the shuttle spread apart. The ramp began to extend as I took my breather clip from a panel and attached it to my beak even as the wash of air from the hangar billowed my robes behind me. I slowly drew in a lung of air, feeling the breather clips draw against my breath as it filtered the gases the humans breathed that would be dangerous to me. Down the ramp, I saw a human standing with his arms at his side, his hand pulled to his brow in a salute, but my eyes were drawn to a mural on the hangar's exit partition, the last thing anyone would see leaving the station. What is that? What does it say? 
one of my aides whispered to another. I stared up at the mural. I had seen the picture that the mural was modeled after, one of the last images of Antares, a shirtless human. Blood rolling down an arm with a club in hand, three dead Vral assault soldiers at his feet. The human was facing the camera, looking toward the sky. His left hand was raised, his middle finger held up in what I knew to be a gesture considered obscenely insulting to the humans. The words of the text were the battle cry of Antares, shortened in some cases, but the meaning not forgotten. It's from a picture called The Final Word of Antares. I said, feeling the chill running along my spine once more. The words say, Better to die on your feet than live on your knees. Chapter 3 Addendum to File Excerpt from The Boys in RG113 The Unedited Memoir by Clyde Andrews Orion War Supplemental Fourth Vrawl War File has been translated and transcribed. Day 2262 of the Fourth Vrawl War you can get used to anything, or at least we can. We had one major advantage over the Vrawl in the wars that they just couldn't counter. The Vrawl need rest time, a lot more than we do. Not only that, a funny quirk about the hyperspace lanes is they give you a bit of a warning bell when someone's coming. About two hours worth. Just switch your view to read energy outputs like you would if you were checking to see if a reactor was thrumming or not. And you can actually see a halo of charged particles around where a ship will be exiting the lane. Easy two-hour warning bell, three if they were bringing something big. That's plenty of time to catch a nap for us. We didn't know it at the time, but in Helena, the Vral's fleet command was ripping its hair out trying to figure out how to deal with Thermopylae, and for the past two months they had been trying to exhaust us by sending a few squadrons at a time to fire on us at max range with their jump drives already spooled up to leave. Makes sense their entire damned species is bald. They've been at this for almost fifty years on and off. Every so often they'd bring in an actual attack and try to break the station after the pop-and-drop routine had gone on for a few days or so. All they really did was drill us on timing out when they'd arrive in systems so we could be the first to greet them with a railgun to the face. It got to be a competition, which, of course, the missile guys just had to ruin. It's hard to tell which gun pod fired first when the displays went to dark mode because the guy you were shooting at just ate a sun. The Vrawl kept trying to exhaust us and it wasn't working. They were pissing us off, but what else is new? The first Vrawl war had only lasted about two years tops. The second war kicked off two years after that and lasted about four and ended when the Vrawl had a bigger fish to fry. I don't suppose they had to care. We were completely cut off from the wider galaxy and they had all the resources and time in the world. Everyone knows about the third Vrawl war? In fact, that's when the gun pod my crew basically lived in was mounted, on the spine of one of our cruisers that took a lucky shot that voided most of the ship into space. Then there was the Third War. Twenty-six years of constant siege and the Vrawl trying new tactics and weapons. Boarding torpedoes, deployable missile pods, thermal lances, the unguided cluster bombs. They brought everything. About midway through, they started using thunks, the massive armored super bombs the size of cruisers. We're still lucky that the first time the damned thing wasn't a shaped charge or it might have blown the entire station to hell. After that, we knew what to do with them. The blockade runners were the worst, and it caused the most grief. They'd load up a ship, armor it to hell, then launch it with the purpose of just driving it through and trying to get to the core systems. I'll say this about the Vrawl. When they decide they want to kill you, they are going to throw everything they can into it. We lost two colonies to that. We lost almost two million on Earth to that. After 26 years of them dumping ships and ammunition into us for weeks at a time, only stopping to refit, they just sent through a message boy saying we were at peace again. It's not like we were in any position to argue at that point. Our entire economy had to be bent towards war production and very little else. Hell, our entire lives were the war. By the time I was born, the war had been going on for six years and no one knew if Thermopylae was going to hold or not. I felt bad for my parents. They shouldn't have felt guilty, but I guess they did. They kept telling me about how life was when they were kids, before the first war broke out. Mom cried a lot. She kept on talking about things like recitals and prom. When I was in high school, she mentioned prom a lot, asking when it was, but we just didn't have time for that. I don't envy them, and I'm not mad about it. My dad had football, I had tactical sim, my mom had prom. I spent my 17th birthday on a life-fire exercise excursion. 
I just remember how many times one of our arms instructors said sorry to us, or when we were learning military supply when I was nine, trying to figure out requisition forms, how the woman leading our group just started crying about it. She kept on saying we were just kids. I felt bad for the Chua most of all, but they're so pragmatic it's actually awe-inspiring sometimes. We kept promising to build them a habitat that fit them, but every time they would buckle down and insist we use the resources for ships and weapons. Tac Tac, bless the little guy, practically lived in the charged coil assembly. Not even Barkley complained when we would keep the crew turret at 30 degrees just so the little guy could come out and talk to us. Even then he was cold. Anywhere else he had to wear a thermal suit. His people had to live near the equator on Earth and we had to build domes pretty much everywhere else just so they could survive. They need heat and humidity. Too cold and they go into shock, too dry and their lungs would stop working. They were already calling us the cheated generation by the time I was three. Words like recess and electives that my parents said I should have were just foreign concepts to me. The concept of toys by the time I was eight was non-existent. I never noticed the looks from the older people. I just assumed once you got older that's how you looked at kids. Most adults when I was growing up would look at us like they were concerned. Like they were worried we'd break something but I got it when I was older. You don't really remember yourself wanting to go and do things with your friends. But not being able to because we were in lockdown. Because the Vrawl had a fleet breakthrough. And they were within a few days travel time. My mom telling me how my dad spent six months trying to catch her attention and the almost mystical story of their courtship meant legitimately nothing to me considering what my relationships were like. None of us had time for any of that. We just never had the time. As I got older, now I understand. They weren't looking at us like we'd break something. They were looking at us like they were the ones breaking us. A kid shouldn't be having duck and cover drills. They shouldn't be learning basic survival skills or how to survive in the event of a bombing. We shouldn't have been learning basic weapon drills or improvised weapons for self-defense. We shouldn't have had practice drills where we reported to the armory, drilled up and went forward to fight off an invader. We were kids. My son is a kid. I listened to my mother talk about playing when I was a kid that she wishes I could play more. It sounded almost insulting back then. Play? What the hell was play? I don't want much right now, I just want my fucking son to play. I want him not to be taught like I was that death can come from above at a moment's notice. I want to see him running around doing things without getting yelled at by drill teams. I want to see my son laugh at something other than the same gallows humor that is all we seem to know anymore. I can't though, he has to live. He has to live more than anything. So Dad has to go light years and twelve hyperlane jumps away to sweat his ass off in a railgun turret for six and a half months, while he has to learn how to clear a jam from an A-95 ramjet pulse rifle. Why? Because of the vrawl, because of those laughing, split-faced, drooling savages. We thought after the Third War they would have had enough after everything they tried they'd be leaving us alone, but they haven't. Wiping out as many as they have isn't enough. Enslaving as many as they have isn't enough. They want us all. Now here we are, six years into the Fourth War. It's just us and the Chua, and that's it. I know there are others in the galaxy. We learned as much in school, so where the hell are they? How can they just sit back and watch this? The death, the destruction. I learned how we stood up for the Chua. Does no one else in this universe care about anyone but themselves? We've been fighting the Varal almost non-stop now for damn near 50 years and we've always been on the knife edge of them breaking out and taking over, because there's no way that we could stop them if Thermopylae ever fell. One day this is going to turn, they're going to push too hard and lose too much, and when that happens we're going to go after them as hard as we can. We're going to find all the people they took. We're going to find all the Chua and we're going to bring them home. We're going to free all the people the Varal have taken, we're going to make this right. I know it's a pipe dream right now, considering how we're living day to day, but one day we're going to do it. We're going to do what everyone else should have done. We're going to do what they could have done, but just didn't. Because if we don't, we deserve to be wiped out. We're still here. We're still fighting to survive. But damn it, I want more than survival. I want this to mean something. I need this to mean something. It's almost time I just reached over and checked my sight. We've got about ten minutes at the most before we're in the middle of it again. I'm going to put this down and get the crew up.
Tac Tac isn't back from the infirmary yet. He almost killed himself three days ago trying to keep up with us. The Chua have the same rest and sleep issue that the Vral do, but no one in this gun crew will ever say a bad word to him, and anyone that does is getting stomped, and that's a fact. Barkley just came back in, he was visiting Tac Tac. He said, and I quote, the gecko-looking bastard wanted me to smuggle him in here. Damn, I love Tac Tac. Drake is already prepping rounds for autocycle. It's time for me to recycle the gun mounts and sight in. The two hours is almost up. They're coming. Chapter 4. Addendum to File. Electronic correspondence between Viktor Prolinsky and Shialak Zisov. Fourth for all war. Shiz, we launched it today. Oh my god, it's a beautiful thing, and yes, I know I owe you a crate of pineapple, and yes, I will fall upon my knees and sing the stupid song of apology in front of your elders for doubting you. And no, I do not care at all if you were joking about that. We're already prepped to lay down another keel for the second of its class, and your eggmate has already proposed a few ideas that we're running up the chain to get implemented to save time on construction while keeping the integrity of the project. I know I said it was going to look ugly, and on paper it does, but seeing it out here, it's a big beautiful baby shiz. I was in the room with the Admiralty, and by the way, did you know there's a Chua Admiral now? Anyhow, they were talking about how they are already designing destroyers and frigates, and apparently after they launch the last six daily class corvettes, they are going to switch production entirely at the Mars orbital shipyards. Shiz, it's beautiful. The second that power plant turned anyone who had anything to say shut up. It's huge but agile, and it's deadly as all hell. Just like you said it would be. They are going to onload the crew on Earth Station, and it's going straight to Thermopylae. Oh, by the way, something else. That thing you kept talking about? It's a go. I overheard the Admiralty talking about it. They're going to build a shipyard near a moon called Titan next to Saturn, and they are having four suborbitals built to build up the modules they are going to put into place on it. End addendum. Personal recollection of Tiziki Kunazikia Kakietkata, also known as Tika. Senior Ambassador to the Galactic Senate. Head of Diplomatic Relations Council. Tarinika Conclave. Log has been partitioned for study by Diplomatic Relations Council. Third partition. Begin log. I finally turned my attention down from the mural on the wall to the human who was waiting at the end of the ramp. And although I had comforted myself on the entire journey in with thoughts of tombs, it is still a bit disconcerting to see what is so obviously a predator looking at you. His uniform was a stark contrast to United Earth uniforms I had seen before. While theirs had been a pale blue, the human in front of me was dressed in almost midnight black. United Earth military uniforms had a pleasant, almost soft look about them. Apparently the ship design was not the only thing to change. This Terran front officer was all sharp edges and creases, and I took particular note of the pistol holstered at his hip. I almost took an involuntary step back when I met the human's eyes, like two of my aides did. They were narrowed, the pale-skinned man's brow furrowed, and based on what I could remember from interacting with tombs, he was not happy to see us. I paused for a moment, then dipped my head slowly. Ambassador Tika, the human seemed to bark out. I am Commander Nathan Andrews. I am here to escort you to the observation deck in the Hadrian segment. There was barely veiled hostility in the tone. I felt my feathers along my wings and back flatten, and glanced to my aides. I was very thankful the tombs had told me long ago we were hard to read. My aides were standing stock still as statues, and I trilled softly to calm them. This was a species that I knew, or at the very least thought I knew, well. To my staff this was a brand new species that they had never interacted with before. Some of them began to come around, slowly moving their necks and adjusting their wings. I began walking down the ramp and bowed my head deeper. All around my shuttle, humans and every now and then a Chua were milling around speaking. Most of them wore what I took to be maintenance gear, bright oranges and silver reflectors gleaming. Some of them had stopped, looking in our direction. Commander Nathan Andrews, it is most certainly a pleasure. Thank you for your time and courtesy. Lead on at your discretion. The commander practically snapped, turning ninety degrees. Attend, he called out and as I continued down the ramp I noticed the eight camouflage humans and two Chua, wearing what I could only assume to be infantry fatigues and body armor, carrying rifles that probably weighed as much as I did personally, save the Chua, who carried what appeared to be smaller versions of the same. 
my aides fell in line behind me. I stopped beside one of the Chua. The small reptilian was wearing fatigues very similar to the humans, but I could see heating elements braced around the uniform, even along the long, thick tail. It does my heart's glad to see your people again, I said as heartily as possible, lowering and craning my neck to meet the Chua at eye level. The Chua did not look my way, its eyes on the side of its head with pupils drilling a hole into the back of the human's legs in front of him. When I heard of the Vral attack on your homeworld, I feared the worst for your people. I am glad to... I noticed that the noise level in my area had dropped considerably about the same time as the Chua's fingertips paled from the grip he had on his weapon. I looked up, seeing almost all the rest of the work around us had stopped, and all eyes were looking in our direction. My entire body went rigid, and even though I didn't know what or how, even though just moments ago I had warned my staff about this, I knew I had done or said something incredibly taboo. I saw hands tightened into fists, my eyes darting around as some of the humans were even slowly lowered as if they were ready to rush us. Some of the Chua actually had their teeth bared in a threat display, and almost all of the humans were glaring shivs at us. I had a flash of tombs from so long ago in my head talking about how humans expressed emotion facially, and rapidly I tried to place it. I slowly leaned up and backed away from the diminutive Chua soldier, even as I heard the report of hard shoes hitting the deck of the hangar approaching, knowing it was the commander. I couldn't take my eyes off the people surrounding me. My head snapped to the side to look at the commander. Okay, so if you ever see one of us looking at you like this, Toombs had said to me all those cycles ago, while furrowing his brows down, flaring out his nostrils, and curling the side of his mouth to where one of his little fangs were visible. This means something has disgusted us. The more pronounced the change from normal, the more of a mistake you made. If you see a square up on you, and especially if our skin color changes a little, that means something else entirely. I had asked him to demonstrate, and he had stood up. When he did and showed me the same facial features, I had laughed and taken a step back, but even when it was tombs, even when he was just having a bit of fun talking about the differences in our species, the way he was standing, the glower in his eyes, the warping of his face, it had all been enough to send a quake down my legs. As the commander's boots hammered down on the deck and he looked down at me, I saw the flushed skin, the curled lip, the glint of his fang behind it. Contempt. That was the word Toombs had used. Contempt. My legs were locked, I couldn't look away. It was fascinating at the same time I wanted to run back into the shuttle and get off of this station as fast as possible. Please refrain from engaging with the crew, sir, Commander Andrews said, his tones clipped, his facial features slipping back into a mask of placidity after a few moments where I watched as his lip twitched. Yes, of course, my humblest apologies, I said quickly. My staff huddled together behind me and I glanced around at the group that was watching us. The commander started walking our escort following a few moments later. Suddenly I realized without being told that it would probably be best if I kept up. The humans in Chua in the hangar simply watched us leave. The doors to the hangar opened and another wash of cleaner air fell over us as we entered the station proper, but I wasn't looking around anymore. The hallway was brightly lit, which I was glad of. The commander's voice sounded from up ahead. We are approaching the Hadrian Junction in a few minutes. We will go through a slight gravity shift, as the inertial dampeners are adjusted to the orientation of that subsector. If you have difficulties, please inform me immediately so that I can assist you with the transition. As we turned a corner near the end of the hall, I could see what he meant. I saw the deck at almost a 45-degree incline compared to what we were at now, and I watched as a human far in front of us grabbed hold of a hanging guide rail from the ceiling. They shifted themselves, holding the guide rail until the conflict in gravity, pushing themselves along with their feet and using the rail to keep themselves centered. A Chua a few steps behind her simply hopped into the air, kicking his feet out, and landed on the opposing deck without using the handrail at all. I decided to myself that I would try the Chua's method. The commander reached the handrail and actually just pulled his feet up and swung one-handed before planting himself firmly on the walkway and turning to look down at us. Our guard all seemed to have different methods of doing the same. Not to be outdone, 
I reached the hallway and did exactly as I saw the Chua do. I gave a small hop and kicked my feet out to the inclined floor in front of me. When the force pulling down suddenly became the force pulling me what felt like sideways, I tried not to panic, but I landed on the walkway and looked up towards my team. They all followed suit, one at a time, and to my pleasure none of them fell or needed assistance. Once we were all on the same plane of gravity, the commander started walking again, and I fought down a sudden hit of nausea from the shift that had just happened that seemed to come from nowhere. The hallway we were in now was a bit tighter, the flooring more tiled and less laminate. The walls were angled at the ceiling, and there were far more structural support tresses than in the hallway we had just left. Commander, I take it that we are on one of the hulls that was placed around Thermopylae, I asked, just to do something other than walk in silence with my stomach and gizzard in knots. She defended us first as the Hadrian, a combat cruiser in service during the Second and Third Wars, he said, not turning his head to look at us. During the later stages of the Third War, the Hadrian sacrificed herself and her crew, putting herself between Thermopylae and a graviton bomb. He stopped at a passageway intersection. The blast broke the back of the ship and ruptured the forward reactor. The sternward half of the ship has become Thermopylae. This way? He motioned down the hall, and as I turned I saw an open door, and outside of its space. I stepped through and took a breath as I realized what I was standing in. The observation deck was nothing more or less than a segment of the hull that was completely missing and covered with what appeared to be a thick layer of what could have been glass for all I knew. I could actually see, standing on the edge of the hull, a massive railgun cannon just to the side of the observatory. Ambassador Tika to Renika Conclave. I heard an almost melodious voice call out, and my neck craned to look for the speaker. I bowed my head and extended my wings in a gesture of acknowledgement and humility. Finally, someone who wasn't looking at me like I had just ruined their day. A marked uptick. The speaker was a human in a much more elaborate version of the uniform the commander was wearing. A female of the human species, her hair was gray, and her eyes didn't hold the off-putting glare that her kin had shown. Standing next to her was a chua in much the same uniform but markedly different to accommodate for the differences in size and the way they held themselves. Fleet Marshal Angela Simmons, Commander of Thermopylae. I've heard so much about you and have been awaiting meeting you for some time, I said. The human smiled at me and I finally felt myself beginning to relax. As have I, but I believe your information on me is a bit out of date. I have been relieved of my honored command of this station and will be taking my next post shortly. She motioned to the Chua at her side. May I present Field Marshal Vicot, the newly appointed commander of Thermopylae Station. The Chua bobbed its head once to me. Welcome, Station. My second Admiral Reynold, stay good. The Chua motioned to a much more gentle-looking human to his side who saluted smartly. I apologize. My translator seems to be having difficulty. I said, I don't believe I'm getting all that you are saying. For the first time, I realized that I had not once ever been in a conversation with anyone in the Chua species at all. Fleet Marshal Simmons laughed. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. The Chua likewise seemed amused. He gave a slight chirp that didn't translate, then motioned to me. Chua, no words fill conversation. Direct, pointed, always. He bobbed his head once, then looked back to Simmons. Like I said, I wouldn't worry about it. Everyone seems to have a lot of filler words in their vocabulary to the Chua people, she said, looking back to the diminutive fleet marshal Vicot. He calls it flowery language, but really it's just a lack of vocabulary that they simply never found the use for. Anything that dresses up speech, pretty much. True. Halftime talker silent, the Chua said, and I trilled a laugh along with them both. I felt all the dread and anxiety from my journey here and the walk to the observation deck falling away. When I heard I was going to meet with a military representative instead of a full ambassador, I did not know what to expect, but these two seemed pleasant enough. Both of them canted their heads to the side as an announcement came over the ship's communication speakers. Now hear this, UTFS Antares arriving in theater in five minutes. Prepare for scheduled broadcast. Excellent. Simmons said, and her Chua counterpart nodded once. I hope you don't mind a bit of theater, Ambassador. I looked back at my aides, curling my neck and rustling my wings slightly. 
letting them know in my own way that all was well. I love theater. The fleet marshals walked to stand beside me and nodded once to Commander Andrews, who turned and with the guard, moved to stand by the hatchway we had come through. I noticed the door to the hatch was still open, and as I turned back to the fleet marshal, her head was turned up, looking through the dome over our heads. A few moments later, Admiral Reynold came to her side and offered her what looked like a handheld transceiver. She cleared her throat, then looked down at her Chua counterpart, who was also looking at the stars and ships beyond. After a moment, she held down a button on the receiver. All hands, this is the fleet. Cease all activity and heed my words. Ninety years ago, we joined in common cause to fight back against cruelty, malice, and indifference. We engaged an enemy that had not found an equal, which found pleasure in inflicting pain, who had enslaved and viciously murdered any who stand against it. She did not stop talking even as I glanced back over my shoulder as humans started coming through the hatchway, making way for Chua in their midst. The fleet marshal stopped, then continued after a few moments' pause. We were beaten back. We saved as many as we could. Eziak, Zizma, Shivru, and Aza all fell. Simmons looked down at Vikot, who only looked out at the stars. Finally, we were pushed back to Antares. We could not defend Antares, but Antares defended herself. For a year and six months, the brave men and women of Antares stood against the Vral, and with their defiance it gave us a chance, a singular chance to shore up the walls, to meet the tide, to make a fortress against the invader, to light one last candle against the darkness. No one spoke, even as more and more people came into the observatory. It was quickly becoming crowded, and as it did, we noticed that Commander Andrews and his guard were coming to form a circle around myself and my staff. Or more appropriately, a barrier. The fleet marshal started to speak again. You stand. We stand. All the humans and the Chua stomped their feet and yelled at once, causing me to flinch from the suddenness of it. Simmons continued speaking, having given them time to repeat the affirmation. In that fortress... The bunker that has safeguarded our homes and our sanctuaries. The shield that has protected us. The bulwark forged from hundreds of hulls and millions of lives spent to give us a fighting chance. You stand. We stand. The entire station seemed to thrum with the sound and vibration of stomped feet. In the halls your fathers did. In the weapons pods your mothers did. Tending the reactors your grandfather did. Manning the flight deck your grandmother did. You stand, we stand. Repairing wounds in hulls that died long ago, eating in mess halls that have served billions, you stand, we stand. Ready to meet the threat of the invader, the enslaver, the butcher, the Vral. Fuck the Vral! The shout came from somewhere I couldn't see, and there was a sudden thunderous roar of approval and the floor seemed to vibrate with the stomping of feet. The voice had carried over the receiver to Great Mother alone knows how many years. They are not my type, soldier, Simmons quipped, chiding, and for a split second I thought there was going to be a disturbance, but the laughter from the humans and the chittering of the Chua next to Simmons made me blink. After a few moments of letting the laughter die down, she continued. Every man and woman, every mother and father, every egg mate, every spouse, every child, every hatchling, all of us. We have made sacrifices and dealt with hardship. We have experienced loss. We have seen lives that should have been full of promise cut short. In ninety years, we have spent seventy-eight of them under siege. We have bled and died, won and lost. We have suffered so that one day we could stand here, in this station, for this moment. My neck snapped to the back as the light cast by the Kelvin system seemed to get swallowed, plunging the observatory into artificial light. My eyes widened as I looked up through the observation screen at a hull that was so enormous it dwarfed the already terrifyingly large vessels that we had flown in and around. If the sight of the battleships had filled me with dread, the sight of this almost struck the life from me. Dark, jagged hull segments were interlocked with railguns and laser batteries the size of destroyers, missile pods that were on display coming out of hull plates with more warheads than I could count and more weapons the make and model of which I couldn't even begin to understand. It was an absolute avatar of war. It had to be as large as the station itself. The entire deck was completely silent, 
and I couldn't pull my eyes away from the sight of the horror overhead to look at their expressions. Suddenly a small vibration was felt on my side, and I reached for a small pouch on my belt. I noticed all of my aides were doing the same. I pulled out my small data pad, and on the front was a message from my attaché on my homeworld asking if we were aware of the signal being transmitted. I opened the message and heard an almost muted version of the very speech I was listening to, only with a few seconds delay. This speech was being broadcast to the wider galaxy. I quickly input a reply letting them know that I knew of the address and to stand by. Simmons suddenly began shouting, bellowing into the receiver, and my head snapped to look at her, seeing fresh tears streaming down her face. Let the memory of all those years serve as an example to us all. The dead cry out, the living cry out, and to those who are held in bondage, know that we have never forgotten you. We have refused to forget you. As we ride out, we will hold fast the sacrifices that our ancestors made for us and that we have made for those who come after. Officers all over the deck were trying to keep people from shouting, and for a few moments I was afraid we were about to be swallowed by an absolute riot of fervor. Our people do not cower in fear when faced with the cruelty of this galaxy. We do not yield when we face the indifference of some in it. We stand. We stand, came the thunderclap of a response. We stand, Simmons yelled again. Again came the response from what seemed like the entirety of every soul on the station and in the fleet overhead. Simmons' voice cracked as she roared the declaration again, and the affirmation was simply deafening. And we are still here. She thundered into the receiver. The humans seemed to erupt. The Chua were lifted onto shoulders as Simmons held the receiver up, keeping it keyed so the sound of the fleet could echo into the galaxy. I suddenly realized I was huddled with my staff together in a tight knot. The fleet marshal reached up and made a motion with her hand. Quickly the noise began to die down, others repeating the gesture, quieting each other as all eyes looked to Simmons. She was still holding the receiver down. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I was staring at her with my beak hanging open like a complete dullard. We're coming for you, she hissed into the receiver, a threat and a promise all the same. All hands, she suddenly yelled. Prepare to ride. Prepare for war. She held up the receiver again to a cacophony of noise. She held it up even as she knelt, and Fleet Marshal Vicot grasped her finger and patted her hand. She nodded to him before looking to me. Finally, she let go of the receiver and handed it off to Admiral Reynold. She began stalking my way, an expression on her face that suddenly made me feel like I was about to be not just killed, but devoured. I backed up, running directly into my staff who were huddled behind me and almost squalled in terror before I realized she wasn't heading for me, but for the door. I heard Vicot's voice over the station speakers. All fighters undock host carriers. Prepare disembark fleet. Fleet Marshal Simmons paused next to me even as Commander Andrews was making a way for her. I looked up at her. Toombs' lessons came back to me as I saw her expression. Disdain was etched onto her face. Disdain for me. Disdain for everything I represented. She had masked it all before, but it was now on full display. I slowly tried to straighten but felt like I had the ship that was over our heads parked on my chest. Her lip curled into a sneer. What's the matter, Ambassador? I thought you liked theatrics. Chapter 5. Addendum to File, excerpt from The Boys in RG-113. The unedited memoir by Clyde Andrews. Orion Wars Supplemental, Fourth Vrawl War. File has been translated and transcribed. Day 2963 of the Fourth Vrawl War. I'm not sure what to make of this war anymore. I'm just not. It's honestly stopped being a war a long time ago. Now it's just an endurance challenge, just like the last one. I'm not even sure what the aim is to them. Is it to exhaust us? How long can they keep this up? How long can we keep this up? To be honest, it doesn't make sense to me anymore. They have us bottled up in here. We can't leave. Why is this even continuing? Is it pride? Is it something else I can't even rationalize? I'm just not sure anymore. Is this how the last generation felt? Is this all there is to us anymore? Some days we'll just have a hot drop come out of the lane and launch some sort of WMD at us. Others we are fighting full fleets. It's hard not to feel like they are just toying with us, and I'm trying to convince myself they aren't. My crew hasn't killed a Vral ship in six months, 
As soon as we start pounding away at one, they just tuck tail and go right back to the Mandeville and jump away before we can really do anything substantial. Focus fire does jack because they apparently can tell how many gun ports are pointed their way, or missiles for that matter. The only thing we have right now that's actually taking things out would be the mass accelerators. But even then, the second those things start to charge and swing towards someone, they all just kind of scatter. And they aren't bringing anything big enough that can't just do a quick 180 and nope out back to Helena either. They have bigger ships, more powerful ships, but it's almost like they're going to press us until we just fall flat over from exhaustion. Still, it's always nice to see a Vral Corvette with a crew that isn't on the ball get turned into shrapnel and mist. Every so often I see one of our ships start to drift out of nowhere. If life on station is rough, I can't even imagine what it's like for the fleet. If they pull back, the Vral will just concentrate fire on us, and no matter how much Durasteel and shielding we have, it won't last long enough for them to cover us. They have to stay out there constantly. Tac Tac hasn't brought out the Binox in a long time, and frankly, I don't want to look at them up close either. Yeah, new ones are arriving constantly. Any time a new cruiser shows up, the Vral seem to take a special pride in blasting the hell out of it. I used to really get excited when I'd see a squadron of corvettes or a cruiser show up. Hell, even the destroyers. Now I just want to ignore it's there because in a few days it might not be. The fleet is nothing more than a bunch of beaten relics held together with duct tape and hope anyway. They're all just pitted hulls patched up a lot like this station. It's only when I'm writing do I realize how long I've been at this. Eight years. The only good thing is they are pulling my team off the line in a month. I won't be processing out. I'm coming back, so is Barkley, and if Barkley's coming back, so is Tac Tac. Drake I'm not too sure about. His brother was on the Seattle when it got half its hull blown out, which leaves him the only one left out of five kids. He still hasn't gotten over it either. He's just pissed all the time. I would be too if I'd been monitoring comms like he does and had to process that. End addendum. Addendum to file. Intercepted Diplomatic Corps message. Ambassador Hvitsikau to the Empress Supreme of the Baraki Order. Exact date of message estimated to be in the final stages of the Fourth Vral War. My glorious Empress, I wish to inform you of news of the ongoing war between the Vral Empire and United Earth. My last missive spoke of a sudden spike of information coming from the Helena system. There has been a major development. This has been confirmed by three sources other than my own. The Vral have suffered major losses against the humans in the Kelvin system at the station that the Vral have taken to calling the Druskal Alashe. Roughly translated, it's a monster from ancient myths of a hateful and spiteful entity that judges the unworthy. As you are no doubt aware, my glorious Empress, the Vral have not used their larger ships against the human station for the last near thirty cycles. Choosing to keep them in reserve while attempting to break the humans' resolve using a broad range of tactics. From what I'm being informed of, and please pardon your humble servant if this is not proven entirely accurate by time, the Lord Imperial had placed a new fleet admiral in charge after executing his predecessor for making no headway, as the last twelve have gone since this war began. I'm not sure who was given the reins of the United Earth Front as of this time, but before I had even the time to uncover the death of the old admiral, the new admiral had gone and hurled the entire Vral war fleet directly into the mouth of Druskal Alashi. Today the Vral ambassador was absent from his usual place. Possibly he was monitoring the battle, but I'm unsure. What is sure, and what I have been able to confirm, is that even after all this time the humans held the station. The Vral have suffered what appear to be catastrophic losses. In fact, the Vral are already referring to this battle as the culling. My source within the Vral military has confirmed that the Vral Empire lost well over a thousand vessels of cruiser tonnage and above. From what I've been informed of, the pride of the Vral fleet did not leave the Kelvin system, and that plus the other confirmed and unconfirmed losses placed the Vral battleship losses at near total. I'm actually still being approached by other ambassadors who are more than willing to let me know about Vral movements on their border, and their military chatter is at the highest level since the Brunel crisis. The entire Vral war fleet seems to be shifting ships towards the United Earth Front. News of this has pretty much stopped the business of the day here at the Senate. As you can imagine, there are many here that were quite nervous awaiting news of the conclusion of the battle once it was learned it had started. The Pyrocet ambassador had to be medically removed from his seat while we were awaiting updates, 
as his people have long been considered the Vral's next target for conquest. I believe he can rest easy for some time longer. The Vral are single-mindedly obsessed in their approach to war, and in their entire time being known to us they have never declared war on one nation, while another still resisted it. The Vral have been so utterly consumed with United Earth that I'm wondering if there is a religious component we haven't seen or have overlooked when it comes to the Vral themselves. As soon as I have the finalized data compiled and analyzed, I will of course send you a full accounting, if one even exists. The Vral have already initiated several lockdowns of communication going out of their empire. They even stopped those dreadful broadcasts. I fear for the slaves they hold for the Vral have not taken the resistance of United Earth well in the first place. My glorious Empress, as I was preparing to encrypt this message, we have received an update to which you should be made aware. A Vakosi envoy just provided us with an intercept from the Vral who survived the assault. They are making the claim that during the battle they were expecting to break through until a small fleet of ships with hull configurations they had not seen before entered the battle, much different than what they've encountered previously. I am forwarding several captures of some of these ships that were intercepted, and my sovereign you will immediately see a stark contrast in previous United Earth designs that we have seen before. For the first time in twenty cycles a message has come from the humans. They are apparently no longer calling themselves United Earth, and have renamed themselves the Terran Front. They have transmitted a video feed of the battle, which I am watching while I write this missive, although unfortunately we only have a few fragments of the file that got through before the Vral took countermeasures to stop the transmission. I am also forwarding this to our military analysts to give you a more detailed report. Aside from the file, they only sent a single message. We are still here. End addendum. Chapter 6 Personal Recollection of Tiziki Ku Nazikiya Kakiat Kata, also known as Tika, Senior Ambassador to the Galactic Senate, Head of Diplomatic Relations Council, Turinika Conclave. Log has been partitioned for study by Diplomatic Relations Council, Fourth Partition. Begin Log. It's hard for me to recall the next bit. I was too busy trying to keep my staff from losing their collective heads and further embarrassing themselves. I left more than my fair share of feathers on the deck of the human ship. Pork Zia fully molted the outer layer of his chest from the stress of it all. I normally like to give a full recounting of where we were walked and why, and any notes of interest, but this was all such a shock. The humans were different, much different than I last knew them. I became starkly reminded that they ate meat, and apparently at the same time so did Kazia. Poor dear Kazia. He left a mess right there on the deck plating. We were unceremoniously herded back the way we had come, the entire time surrounded by humans who stopped to unleash almost bestial roars of approval at the field marshal. When we reached the Hadrian Junction, most of us managed the gravity difference, but Tiska Lavura, my scribe, collapsed on the deck. None of the humans stopped to help. We had to pull her up and usher her along. As we re-entered the hangar, I was hoping this nightmare was at an end, but it was far from over. Instead of heading towards the smooth and elegant shuttle, we were guided towards a much different kind of craft. Sleek and looking like it was built for pure speed, we were guided on board. Before I could even begin to cite an objection, we were already lifting off of the deck of the hangar. Fleet Marshal, I called, doing all I could to keep my voice from betraying just how anxious I was. It can be detected even through a translator, you know. I would like the customary quarters to contact my government and apprise them, but I would also like some clarification. Fleet Marshal Simmons still shocked me how the almost jovial expression she had worn like a mask when we first met had just melted away. She had been leaning on a small strut, watching out of the front viewport as we exited the hangar. She turned her head towards me. Ask your questions, Turinikin. I took a breath, then tried to ruffle my feathers to cool myself. I felt so hot I thought my skin would scald. Have you, on behalf of the Terran Front, just declared war on the Vral? They just recently made peace with you after all. Is this fucker serious? I heard a nearby guard scoff. I felt the quills in my flesh bristle. I went from terrified to outraged. I have been in tense situations before. It is, as they say, part of the life of a diplomat. At no point ever in my entire life have I been spoken to in such a manner, treated in such a manner as I was being treated today. 
to top it all off to have an underling say such a thing? I beg your pardon, I snapped at the guard, turning to him. But before I knew it, the fleet marshal was between me and the guard. I read Tomb's writings on dealing with you and your people. Beg as many pardons as you'd like. She spat, blading her hand and pointing it directly at my beak. Once again, I felt myself doing everything I could not to cower back. Her eyes so close together, the mark of binocular vision. Her lip curled up, exposing the fang that marked her species. I found myself suddenly cataloging everything about her species I knew much like you would find in a summarization. Bipedal locomotion, above average strength and speed. Bite force equal to that of a hifereal wildcat. Endurance capacity far exceeding galactic norms. I saw in her all the things I had never seen in tombs, but had always been there. You want clarification? Yes, I did just declare war. No, you're not going to get customary quarters on Thermopylae. You will be granted them on board the Antares. And yes, before you even ask, we will be departing immediately to engage the Vral. She gave me a smile that I knew was fake the moment it touched her lips. She was looking at me like I was so insignificant, so small. I am the ambassador of the Turinica Conclave, I said. And as desperate as I was to keep the tremor out of my voice, I couldn't help it. You cannot treat me and my delegation like this. We are to be afforded rights. I could feel my staff behind me, huddled against me, and I was doing everything I could to be their pillar of strength. Rights, Fleet Marshal Simmons said. Yes, you have rights, she said and turned as if the discussion was over. I saw nothing but darkness out of the viewport beyond her and suddenly realized that the Antares was filling the entire window. A small horizontal pillar of light seemed to open before us, and before I knew it the shuttle we were on flew through yet another uncomfortable force field. I said nothing. There was nothing to say. Before we even touched down, Simmons was moving to the hatch, and the only thing I could do was follow along. I quite simply had no further idea of what to do than that. I know the onset of Kuravayak syndrome and was feeling its full effects now. As I looked back at my staff, I realized that most, if not all of them, were experiencing the same thing. Heightened senses, overheated bodies, short quick breaths, the dulling of certain abilities like speech and other high-level cognitive functions, the feeling of pure overstimulation, the very flight response built into the most ancient coding of our DNA all of which was meant to handle high-level aerial maneuvers and keep ourselves alive against predators in the skies. I did everything I could to fight the fog in my mind, to get refocused on details, and you'll please forgive me if I do not have much recollection of our journey from the hangar. But suddenly I was aware that wherever we had been led to by the fleet marshal, it was cool enough to start allowing me to come down. As soon I felt the fog of Kurivayik syndrome begin to lift, I immediately saw to my staff, even as I heard Simmons relaying orders. I was still struggling to fully come down, but I was well on my way. I turned my neck to regard Simmons, purposefully breathing slowly and evenly. I turned my full body to her as she stood a short distance away, looking down at a table which was displaying information I couldn't make heads or tails of. We were on the bridge of the Antares. The warship's bridge was filled with displays and humans working behind them, with a sprinkling of chua among the stations. The stations the Chua were at were as tailor-made for them as the human stations were for them. None of them were paying attention to me. My own attention was drawn to the fleet marshal and the table she loomed over. I knew enough of what I was seeing, though, to know that we were rapidly approaching the Mandeville point, where we would enter the hyperspace lane. I knew what was on the other side of that lane. Fleet Marshal Simmons. I had fully regained myself. You are placing my entire team and I in danger. I am not sure you are aware, but the Vrawl have a... Sixty-seven battleships, a fully equipped and armed citadel station, around two hundred carriers of various sizes, including fifty-seven fleet carriers, between six hundred to seven hundred cruiser-class ships, and at least two thousand five hundred other vessels, including but not limited to frigates, destroyers, corvettes, and support craft. Yes, I know. Simmons never once looked up from the table. She motioned with her hand, a beckoning motion that for some reason felt insulting. As I slowly placed one foot in front of the other and reached the side of the table, she motioned down at it. 
then without a word to me began to press a few icons. The data stream presented on the dark glass of the display shifted to display informational readouts. A few moments later the text shifted from the scrawl of human script to the flowing graceful swoops of Turinica Common. She then swept her hand over the table as if she were an artist displaying a new sculpture. It took me a few moments to understand what I was seeing. I am not a military analyst by any means, but once I understood the general information, I knew perfectly well what I was looking at. How? I asked, with a bit more of a higher tone than I intended. The humans only had access to twelve systems, including Kelvin. I'd only seen the shapes of the vessels as we had come in. There were too many to count. And to be frank, it wasn't my purpose. The sensors on the shuttle would have cataloged that. I felt a chill running through me now that had nothing to do with the hostility I had been treated with. Nothing to do with the fact that I was on the same ship with predators. Nothing to do with the way the humans seemed to have changed. Thank the Chua, Fleet Marshal Simmons said with a smile that held more vindictive pride than actual warmth. Their methods of processing and recycling materials? What did you think we were doing with the hulls of the Vral ships? Our own that didn't get bonded to Thermopylae? I craned my neck over the numbers, reading them once again to make sure I wasn't just seeing things. By the way, this is just the primary invasion fleet, she whispered, as if sharing a secret with a friend, but the look in her eyes remained. The fleet that was preparing to jump was four times the size of the one that awaited them, without even counting the massive ship I was on. She reached over and tapped a label on the screen that said, Mantis-class Corvette, and rotated her wrist drawing up design specifications. I had no idea what any of it meant, and I stared at the display. I don't understand what I'm looking at, I said, my fear from earlier completely forgotten in my shock. My apologies, can you please explain? Gladly, she said and motioned as she spoke. What you're looking at is the standard Corvette class in the fleet. It's designed as a close-ranged brawler, crew of twelve. This... She motioned to a list of armaments that I couldn't even begin to understand. Is its loadout? Once again, I was struggling to understand what I was seeing. My apologies again, Fleet Marshal, I said. She rapidly returned the screen back to its original settings, and from this angle I could see multiple markers moving towards the Mandeville Point. Several, including one that signified the Antares, were already prepared. Well, to break it down in terms you can understand, our Corvette is a match for a Vral light cruiser. My blood turned to ice. I tucked my wings in and backed slowly away from the display on the table. I felt ill, and like running all at once. I had read in reports that you started fielding new ships right at the end of the Fourth War. Why did you think they sued for peace so quickly? She remained at the display, staring down at me as I stopped and tried to process what she had said not only about the war's end, but the power they were about to project into Vral space. But the Fifth War, and the Sixth, I said, trying to rationalize this, but also trying to remember reports of my own people's fleet strength, my own people's comparison with Vral vessels that I might have overheard at briefings or summits, snippets in casual conversation. I looked back to Fleet Marshal Simmons, and the predatory look was back in her eye. The Fifth War, she actually laughed. They took two years off to try to convert their entire economy to a war economy. Then they just threw everything they built at us. Eighteen years of that only made our fleets bigger, stronger. By then they knew. They've known for a long time now. She turned back to the table as a female's voice came over the ship's loudspeakers, announcing jump prep. The Sixth War, if you can even call it a war, was them jumping in with wave after wave of corvettes armed with vortex bombs for two months like clockwork every two days. They gave up when they realized they were just feeding us more resources. I didn't speak. Right when she finished talking, I had done the math in my head. The Terran front fleet that was preparing to jump alone would be enough to decimate the entirety of the Vral Empire's fleet, even if she was exaggerating about the gulf in firepower she so flippantly said to me. But even worse, I knew what that meant for my people. A countdown started, and I looked towards the viewport to the endless tapestry of space outside. A thought suddenly occurred to me. Field Marshal, you said you had read Tomb's writings about my people? And myself? 
The older, dark-skinned human's visage appeared in my mind's eye again, so gentle in his dealings, so diplomatic and kind. I have, came the reply. What did he say? I asked, wanting to know the answer, but at the same time dreading it. Field Marshal Simmons emitted a sound that was like a grunt, then she turned from the table. Suddenly the viewport flashed with a dull gray glow and then went completely dark. A shudder went through my spine. We were in the hyperspace lane. I was about to be the first of my species in a combat zone in over a thousand cycles. The automated voice came back over, detailing a time frame we were to exit the transit. The field marshal stepped away from the table and towards me. He said you were a disappointment, not just yourself but your people. You were the most powerful species in the entire quadrant, Simmons said, and I felt the words like barbs on my skin. I was very aware of the meaning of the word were in her statement, and I breathed out. She had just confirmed my worst fears. Why was he so disappointed in us? I whispered, feeling somewhat hurt by the statement. I remembered yet again how her face had slipped its mask, wondering if Tombs had done the same with me, masking his true feelings, hiding them away. Why? she asked, as if the question were the most foolish thing for me to ask. You literally had six ships for every one the Vrall had. The power of those ships were a direct match for theirs. You could have stepped in at any point and the Vrall would have had no choice but to do as you demanded. She stalked up to me then, her voice trailing off to a hiss. The Vrall are cowards to the core. The second your precious conclave have said a word, any word, they would have blustered for about two minutes, three tops, then slunk back home. She pulled up her fingers in front of my eye and snapped them. Just like that. He did everything but get down on his knees and beg you for years to do something, anything. I... my government isn't... I began stammering. Isn't warlike. Doesn't like war. Doesn't like conflict. Her voice dripped with venom and slowly she began to walk around me. I felt my joints lock up again, feeling the urge to take to the air, to run from the predator that was stalking me. I couldn't even turn my neck to follow her. I read his entire diplomatic mission from start to finish. You always talked about how terrible it was, how awful the suffering of everyone the Vrall butchered, how dreadful how many they took as slaves. Your dearest heartfelt most true sympathies for the people they slaughtered. I felt flecks of what could only be her saliva hitting my feathers. She was directly behind me now, and I felt her move forward, and she hissed in my ear. You read every report. You heard them all begging for help. You watched every broadcast the Vrall put out showing what they were doing to them. But you did nothing. Nothing. And you allowed those sons of bitches to do anything they wanted. I, uh, I, Apollo. Save your fucking apology. She growled in my ear. Fuck your fucking apology. You sat and watched entire civilizations put to the sword, watched the Chua's homeworld get glassed, then watched four generations of my people dying by the billions. So fuck you and fuck your apology. She stepped past me, then canted her head to the side, listening as the automated voice called out an updated time. Combat lighting, she called out. Suddenly everything went dark. I heard my team somewhere behind me squall in absolute terror. I stood stock still. Suddenly I was just a chick sitting in my nest home, looking out into the black of night, but without even the faintest light for comfort. My entire world was an inky black that swallowed me, enveloped me. I locked up completely. Behind me I heard a body hit the floor, then another. I heard the scrabbling of clawed feet on the ground as they tried to flee. I smelt the tang of ammonia and realized that I had soiled myself. Suddenly I realized I was breathlessly screaming. My hearts were pounding. Fleet Marshal, I squalled, stepping in my own filth and feeling my fleet slip out from underneath me. In the dark corner of my mind the predators were coming and I couldn't control myself. I was reduced to a mewling chick. I heard my team incoherently chittering behind me. I forgot your species can't see red lighting. I heard her voice so near me yet so far away. Please, I begged, please, light, please. In a bit you're going to get all the light you need, she whispered from somewhere to my right. I heard the hard clack of her boot like a thunder peal in my ears as she took slow, measured steps around me. 
I trembled in fear I could barely comprehend. You're monsters, you're all monsters, I whispered in terror, shuddering as I suddenly realized I had soiled myself again. No, she whispered. We're going to kill the monsters. I felt her hand come down on my wing and I tried to turn my head away. We're going to do what you should have done. Her voice had become melodic, low like a vorsha snake. We're going to be what you could have been, what you should have been. Her voice made me feel like I was being sized up, like I was about to be devoured by the hungry things in the dark. We're going to start with the Vrall, and then we're going to find any of our people and any other people who are being held enslaved. I felt her stroking my wing as if she was trying to calm me, and the sensation only made me want to squall until my throat bled. I felt her hand slowly curl under my head, and felt her lifting my head and neck up. I felt her lips brush against my head right next to my ear. <laughs> we know. Her voice was soft, almost gentle in my ear. For a moment I didn't understand. She gently laid my head back down in my own filth where she had picked it up, then wiped her hands on my wing feathers. The darkness was my entire existence. What was she talking about? What did she even mean? Was she trying to soothe me? We know. She whispered again. Suddenly a flash of light came through the viewport, and for a split second I could see her silhouette against the blackness. Another flash of light, and my heart seized in my chest. Like lightning, the telltale re-entry from the hyperspace lane to real space was illuminating her standing over me. Monsters, I managed to wheeze out. You're the monsters, she whispered, her eyes glaring down at me where I lay. She wanted to kill me. In my hearts I knew it. She wanted me dead. She wanted to do it herself, but she was restraining herself. Suddenly realization dawned on me and I knew what she was talking about. I couldn't feel anything else. I was already so terrified that the realization of what she was talking about did nothing further to me. But how could she know? How did they even find out? I felt my beak working, trying to form words, but none were coming out. The humans knew. They knew we had bought their people. My people are physically weak, not suited to hard labor. When the Vrall offered us their excess from the wars they fought, we had gladly taken it. After all, why would we not? We were superior in all other ways. Why not use the inferior species to make up for the very few shortcomings we had? As I looked up at the field marshal, I suddenly came to regret brokering that deal, made before we even had met the humans. We kept the Vrall's offerings hidden, away from prying eyes on mining stations and generators. But now the humans knew. The lightning seemed to stop for an eternity, but in the blackness that remained all I could see was two icy blue eyes staring at me from the darkness, watching me squirm helplessly in my own filth. A predator's eyes. I squalled low in terror. We're coming, the eyes narrowed. We want them back, and you're going to give them to us. The eyes suddenly drew close to me. And if you try and stop us, they'll write about what I do to your people for a million years. The eyes stared at me. A hunter's eyes, a demon's eyes, a monster's eyes. There was a low rumble through the ship and the automated voice came over the ship's loudspeakers again. The flashing of lane ejection was illuminating the entire bridge now. I could see her clearly, long flashes of light interrupted by short periods of horrifying darkness. I'm going to slaughter your little bastard friends now. You should watch. You've got a good seat right there where you are. I heard her voice sliding like a hurlcat's growl into my ears. She stepped away from me then and grabbed a receiver sitting by the table. From my place on the ground, I could see out the viewport as the black screen became gray. The gray became streaks of gray. Then those streaks solidified into stars. Jump complete, the automated voice chimed. On the view screen, I saw specks that could only be the Vral fleet. They weren't in battle formation. They were burning away from the Mandeville point. The fleet marshal stood over the table again, and I heard her voice over the loudspeakers even as I heard her nearby. All ships, this is fleet. Launch all fighters. Engage at your discretion. Run them down. Accept no surrender. Fire at will. Her voice was calm, clear. Her attention was locked on the table. She didn't turn around once for the few scant hours it took to wipe the entire Vrall presence out of the Helena system. She barely spoke any orders, letting the fleet take out almost a century worth of rage. I did not try to rise when the fleets engaged. 
I did not look to my staff as desperate hails for surrender chimed in on the stations only to be completely ignored. I didn't try to speak as I had watched vessel after vessel be ran down, engaged, and destroyed. I just laid there in my own filth and watched the Vrall die. 